Hi folks. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. We have a speaker or two that's not yet here, but they, they will be here shortly. So I, I want to get going. Um, my name is Chris Miller. Uh, I lead the advocacy and activism work at Ben & Jerry's. I'm just here to act as your MC, although the company is strongly supportive of this legislation. So we're here today uh, to urge the Vermont legislature to move forward with their effort to end qualified immunity. You know, as many of you know, qualified immunity was, in fact, invented by uh, the courts in the Jim Crow South uh, to prevent people who were victims of police misconduct from having their day in court. Um, the Vermont legislature can fix this problem, and we're here today to ask the legislature to act and to pass legislation that would end qualified immunity. We have about 10 speakers. Folks are going to be relatively brief. I'd ask uh, that you uh, hold questions until the end. And so uh, with that, I would uh, uh, invite our first speaker, um, uh, Senator Rom Hinsdale, to uh, say a few words. Thank, Thank you for being you. here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Thank you so much for being here on a day that we are recommitting to ending qualified immunity in Vermont. I personally and, and particularly want to thank Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, not only for standing up for this issue and standing up for criminal justice reform, but also because we should enjoy free ice cream. We should remember that we deserve joy and that everyone deserves to have joy and eat ice cream and remember why life is worth living. And who has that right and privilege been taken away from? It's been taken away from Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old when he was killed by the police. It's been taken away from George Floyd, who can never have ice cream with his daughter again. It's been taken away from Ahmaud Arbery, who can't go out for a run and then get a scoop of ice cream. Amir Locke, and on and on, Breonna Taylor. And so, so often, we have to remember that people of color deserve joy too. They deserve to be able to get a scoop of ice cream with their kids. And, and pass wisdom and joy on to the next generation. And so often, because of corruption, misconduct, and police brutality, that is taken away from them. I was 13 years old when I was arrested by the LAPD with a friend of mine who is also brown. We were on a street corner a block away from her house getting something she needed at the store at about 9.30 at night. And two officers pulled up and the first two questions they asked us were, are you Mexican? Are you sure you're not Mexican? And then they told us we were breaking curfew and took us to a precinct that was about 45 minutes away from where we were a block away from her house on a school night. They handcuffed us to a bench and they didn't talk to us for most of the rest of this school night. And finally, when they went to call our parents at at around 2 a.m., another officer came over. And I thought, you know, that officer had a look of concern on his face. And I thought, finally, you know, I don't, I, I think we've ended up with some really bad police officers who held us for most of the night, didn't share our rights with us, didn't call our parents. And that officer came over and he said, hey, it's pretty late to have these young girls here on a school night, don't you think? And the officers that had detained us said, you know what? We're getting overtime for this. It's fine. And that officer that I hoped would be the good cop would be the one to say, that's not right. Where Have you called their parents? Do they know their rights? Have you talked to anybody? Laughed and walked away. And that's what a system does that has no accountability built in, is even if you have a good officer, one who you think shares some concern for your well-being as a 13-year-old kid, the system doesn't really create a lot of opportunities for them to hold their colleagues accountable. And that officer walked away that night. And that's when I learned that you can't have a system that just relies on good cops to police bad cops. You need actual accountability. You need to end qualified immunity and remember that officers of the law who have the right and ability to detain people, to pull a gun on people, and to take away their civil liberties, and in some cases take away their life, need more accountability, not less than every other job in America. 
And that's why we're here today to ask folks to end qualified immunity. And it's not just about the folks in other states that we know and, and my own experience in, in Los Angeles. You know, we know that Greg Zullo in, in Castleton area was detained by the police for having snow on his license plate. And they, instead of, you know, helping him along his way and giving him a warning, asked to search his car. And when he refused, they towed his car, impounded his car, and he had to walk in the snow back to the college campus. Or Mark Johnson, who will never be able to enjoy ice cream again, who was gunned down in Montpelier, someone with known mental illness who had an air gun in his hand that officers thought was a dangerous weapon. We have issues here in Burlington where you see that black teenagers are detained almost at the same rate as white teenagers in a city where they are a tiny fraction of the population compared to white Burlingtonians. And where in Chittenden County, young black men make up two and a half percent of the youth population, but 25 percent of those charged as youthful offenders in court. This is a system that is broken in Vermont that we need to fix in Vermont. And finally, I'll say, you know, I've talked to officers about this legislation because I've spent a decade in the legislature fighting so that law enforcement has the trust they need to do their job and protect and serve all Vermonters. And when we talk about this bill, they say, we, we can't possibly pass this bill. We have a shortage of law enforcement officers, and this will take away the ability for us to recruit more law enforcement officers. Well, first of all, we don't want the kind of law enforcement officers that don't believe in accountability, that don't believe in oversight of their job, which, which Americans and Vermonters are supposed to be guaranteed. And second of all, we have a shortage of nurses. We have a shortage of educators. And do we say, just reduce the standards? Just get rid of the accountability measures. You know, who cares if your kids aren't, aren't educated as well in school? Who cares if you don't get the quality you need in the hospital? Because we have a shortage of those staff. No, we don't do that. And that's not what we should do for law enforcement either. So I ask, and I'm joined by so many other community leaders and 75% of Vermonters in asking that the legislature end qualified immunity and finally bring responsiveness and accountability to law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ron Hinsdale. I did forget to mention that we will be serving ice cream in the shop after this, so stick around for that. If I could ask uh, Representative um, Selena Colburn to come forward. Thank you. Hey. Well, I really want to start by thanking everyone for being here and, and thanking folks for organizing this event. And a huge thanks to Senator Rom Hinsdale, Senator Ballin, and others who really led on this issue in the Vermont Senate. And I'm really looking forward to working with them as a member of the Vermont House. It's clear um, from the stories we just heard, from stories we've heard again and again, that our system of justice in this country often delivers anything but justice. It's true in Vermont where we see documented racial disparities, as Keisha just noted, in really every step of the criminal legal system process. We have the worst record uh, for disparities and in incarcerations in the country, in the state of Vermont. And the process of how these disparities happens, it was recently affirmed in a report by the Council of State Government that the legislature uh, commissioned that showed that black people in Vermont are overrepresented in misdemeanor and felony prosecutions by up to 14 times more likely to be charged with a felony for, for drug offenses. The good news is that there is truly, I believe, growing support for transformation of our justice system and for how we respond in this country and in this state to people who cause harm and to survivors and victims of crime. But we have to reevaluate the role of police in our communities to, to enact this transformation. We have to be asking ourselves, when is a police response the appropriate response? And we also have to be asking, in cases where it is, how do we really build trust with police in our communities? 
There are many answers to this, so I don't want to pretend that qualified immunity is the only answer because that's what happens after something really terrible has happened, right? So we need policies um, to create equity in our justice system all across the board. We need community oversight of police. We need better training. We need to really investigate alternative responses to what are sometimes called behavioral crises for really understanding when a police officer maybe isn't the right person to be responding. We need to look at state's attorney Sarah George is doing here at limiting what's sometimes called secondary enforcement, those kind of pullover stops that can then escalate and really rethinking about how we criminalize drugs and poverty and a host of other things in our um, state that are really social constructions. So ending qualified immunity alone is not enough, but it is a really important piece of this puzzle. Vermonters who experience abuse, injury, or even fatality at the hands of police deserve their day in court. I worked in the state legislature as a member of the House Judiciary Committee on our recent revisions to the police use of force policies that we have. And I can tell you that the laws governing police conduct in this state already include significant balancing factors and protections for officers, as they should. Um, so we really need to get rid of this practice of just wholesale shielding officers because that tips the balance and it really nullifies our efforts at reform in other areas. So I want to join Vermonters who have spoken really loudly and clearly in support of ending qualified immunity in this state, in support of transparency and accountability in policing, and I really hope that my we'll see this bill cross um, over from the Senate to the House and really look forward to working on it there and, and getting the strongest policy that we can for the state of Vermont. So thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Coburn. Uh, next up, uh, Senator Becca Bowen. Good afternoon. I think I want to start by saying I, I come to this not just as a legislator, but also as a parent and someone who has studied history for a long time and has been a student of history for a long time. And when I have a platform like this, it's really important to lift up other voices who are more directly impacted by this on a regular basis. So I want to talk about uh, the writer Isabel Wilkerson for a moment, black writer who has an amazing book called Cast. And what she says is we have an invisible caste system, not invisible to her as a black woman, but invisible to so many other people in this nation and that we actually are in many ways not different from India and not different from Germany during the Holocaust. That we too have a caste system here. And she said, when you have a caste system and you're not seeing it for what it is, you don't see that the structure itself that the society is built on is actually rotten at the base. And she likens it to an old house. And that you have to tend to that rot. You have to tend to the base of the system that is flawed. And that's what we are doing by examining qualified immunity for the very first time in 50 years in Vermont in the Senate and saying, just because it's been this way doesn't mean it has to stay this way. That we have to be able to look under the hood of the system and say, is it doing the things that it was intended to do or is it having, in fact, an impact on all of us as a society. That's what we're trying to do in the Senate. And I wanna thank uh, Senator Rom Hinsdale for speaking to, you know, we've heard from a lot of law enforcement that they're very uncomfortable with this. And I can tell you, as a gay woman, there were people who were very uncomfortable with me having equal rights. They were very uncomfortable with civil unions, and very uncomfortable with civil marriage. We have seen this before. And it doesn't mean that we, as a society, shouldn't be examining the system and figuring out, is it serving the needs of all people? 
So I am so excited to be here with all of these people behind me. I wanna keep it brief because there are other voices I want you to hear from more. And I just wanna thank you for being engaged in this issue. I really hope we are gonna continue to make progress on this in the Senate. And the last thing I wanna say is I wanna thank Senator Sears and Senator Bruce, who I know uh, could not be here, but they both believe we must not just accept that something is right just because it's been that way for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Ballant. Next up, I'd like to invite uh, Kaya Morris, who is the Executive Director um, of Rights and Democracy. Thank you all for joining us today for this important conversation. Um, and just a reminder that black lives still matter. What we are really fundamentally trying to address in this moment is that we had a cultural awakening that went and reverberated across the globe around the disproportionate relationship we have between those whom we have emplaced and, emplaced and trusted and trusted in saving and serving our communities from harm to become those that are the actors creating the harm for our communities. We have a legacy that goes back to the beginning of this nation's founding that has treated certain individuals as subhuman and as a less deserving of their human rights. And so what we found that happened in that last year or two of this pandemic is that people said we're not interested in the status quo that I will not let my brother fall behind, and that we must understand that what feels safe for me feels entirely unsafe for someone else. And those same pillars we look to for security are visions of terror for some members of our community. That people will not seek assistance from law enforcement because they know that their requests and their cries may be twisted and used against them and criminalize them for doing so. That there is a constant fear that when you are pulled over, that violence may erupt. That that particular police officer on that particular day may have made some difficult choices that have led to this unfortunate moment that means the very end of your life. And so we were here on the streets and we had youth parked in front of City Hall here in Burlington. And we had things painted on the roads declaring that Black Lives Matter and that this is gonna be a new day. And what's happening right now? It's a retraction. We're finding that that same energy is still, it's, it should be there, but it's dissipated. And so now it's still the same folks who are putting themselves on the front line to make progress that are actually back in the line of fire because the allies are gone. So there was a promise at the beginning of this year, at the beginning of this legislative cycle, that we were gonna put forth a bill to end qualified immunity. And that bill has been gutted because the power of the people has not been in the people's house. And the urgency, the cries, and the fear are not felt anymore. And so it's easy to go back to what is comfortable instead of what is right. So I am so proud to be here in this moment, but I am disappointed as well. Because all the people who slept in tents for weeks at a time. All the folks who put themselves in the front lines of these protests and dealt with tear gas and rubber bullets. All the people who lost their lives in the fight, not just in the last few years, but over the last few centuries are looking at us and saying, what are you doing? Why are we unable to get this done? And so, as each of these speakers are going to outline, it is crucial that we continue to press forward on making real, real, actually actualized reform for law enforcement so that we can make a better Vermont 
and one in which people do not have to fear for their lives, nor do they leave, as we keep seeing happening over and over again. We all deserve better. Thank you. Thank you, Kaya. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Zariah Hightower, who's the Executive Director of the Peace and Justice Center and City Council. Hi, everyone. Um, as we all wrestle with what has been happening across the world, one quote in particular has been on my mind, so I'm going to start my speech with a quote because that's what we do. This one is not an inspiring one. Restraint, why are you so concerned with saving their lives? The whole idea is to kill the bastards and end the war. At the end of the war... We want to hear you. Okay. We deserve to hear you. I will wait. <laughs> I feel like this has been my life. <laughs> start. <laughs> Great. So quote, not a good quote, but I'm going to quote them, which is just straight. Why are you concerned with saving their lives? The whole idea is to kill the bastards. At the end of the war, if there are two Americans and one Russian left alive, we win. General Thomas Power, U.S. Air Force, 1960. And I know that quote sounds like a tangent. I promise I will make it work by the end. But what I want to say is that the word reasonable and what is reasonable and who defines it and what it means. Because the word reasonable is very objective. I think all of us will agree that if we look at the person next to us, we probably have a different definition of what is reasonable to some extent than they do. But to another extent, I hope that we today are starting to broadly agree on what is reasonable. But we're still living in a time where 25, 50, 75, 100 years ago, the people who were lifting up as leaders, who we were who were creating the standards, who got to say what is reasonable, when, how, and where, had very little in common with me and what I consider reasonable. They were men like Thomas Power, who could reasonably say that three Americans and one Russian left alive would be a win. They were police who could shoot black men on the reasonable suspicion that they looked like black men wearing jeans in a neighborhood where crime had occurred. They were the public defenders, the judges and the prosecutors who said it is reasonable to shoot first and ask questions later. They're the politicians who called black and brown brothers scary, that they're super predators, that they waged a war backed by billions of dollars. What our society has defined as reasonable has very little to do with reason. It has a lot to do with who's in power and what we want to do to maintain that out power. And I think to the point of what Kaya just said is that it's wild that what we could consider reasonable wins two years ago, one and a half years ago, is sl slowly dwindling away. That the allies that we had, the momentum that we had, is we're not keeping it. There's not, as much as I love to see all of your faces, is a year and a half ago we had momentum to do so much more. and I. I want us to continue to build up the momentum, starting with ending qualified immunity. Thank you all. Thank you, Zariah. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite uh, Reverend Mark Hughes, the Executive Director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Mark. Thanks, Chris. And, um, Thank you, Ben, thank you, Jerry, and thanks for all of you who come out uh, to meet us today and have a conversation about uh, qualified immunity. It is um, really unfortunate uh, that we would have to stand before you today and have a conversation about what we all know is just the right thing to do. It's, it's, it's really quite simple. I think earlier um, at the top of this, uh, press conference, it was mentioned that the, the whole premise of qualified immunity 
is, is really an offshoot of the civil rights movement. Uh, what happened was is, is that a law enforcement officer decided to arrest some black ministers who were accompanied by a dozen white ministers in the freedom rides in Mississippi because they refused not to enter a restaurant. And that's when qualified immunity started, the, the concept of qualified immunity. Catch it, please. <laughs> um, however, it was, it was an adjustment uh, to, as Chris said at the top of the, the presentation, the KKK Act. Now, listen to what I'm trying to tell you. This is why this is all stupid, is, is because the KKK Act, which was enacted in 1871 at the height of Reconstruction, was designed to protect black people from protect their civil liberties. It, that's what it was designed to do. And it was in 1961 when it was deconstructed and replaced with this idea that there should be this thing called qualified immunity that would make people exempt from that same protection. Why are we begging for this? Why is it being positioned in such a way that it's being something taken from the police? This is actually a restoral of civil liberties. This is not taking anything away from anyone. But the, the bigger question is, is why do we even have to have this conversation? The logic tells us is, is that it doesn't make any sense for anybody to be immune to the law, especially the law. Hello. So why, why are we having this conversation? But there are deeper discussions because it seems that every time we start talking, we start talking about civil rights, when we start talking about racial justice, when we start talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we always end up at the doorstep of the police. Why is that? Well, I encourage you to do your history work because the same reason that this, this thing was enacted in the 60s, it stands true today. And that is there is a racial division um, along an economic and a political division along racial lines that has always existed in America. And it manifests itself in the criminal justice system as well as housing, education, employment, health services, economic development, transportation, all the way across the board. So why are we having this conversation when we know that economics is at the center of it? And why do we have delays in the economic policy that exists in our legislature today to address it, especially having with the legislature having already acknowledge that systemic racism is a thing in a joint resolution last year. Why are we still having that conversation? And I think the other piece of this thing, it really has to do with why is it that we have a president pro tem of the Senate, a judiciary chair who is one of the most powerful people in there. Why is it that we have so much power behind this bill but yet and still is being, de is being deconstructed and, and gutted even as we speak. Where is the power to keep this thing together? How could it be that we could have the president pro tem and the chair of judiciary pushing this thing and we still can't get it over the finish line? Why? The reason is, is the same reason that we had this thing passed in the House at the national level and the Senate refuses to take it up. It's because of political and economic power, because it doesn't pay certain people to see this come out the way that it's supposed to come out. So let's call this thing what it is. There's political and economic power that's blocking what we're trying to do. And it's our voices, and it's only our voices that can make this thing come to fruition. How is that? Vote them out. Vote them out. Because if they can't get it done this session here in the state of Vermont, everybody's up for election in November. There is no reason why we should not be able to get this done in this place at this time. 
Everybody knows that this needs to get done at this place and in this time. And if we don't get this done, what it means is there's one thing and one thing only, is that the police are more powerful than the legislator, despite Rule 25 in the House and despite the sixth and seventh article of the Constitution. So I encourage you to get busy because what we're, what we're really doing is, is we're not just holding a legislature accountable in a, a certain chamber that is the judiciary in the Senate. We're holding them all accountable. And if they can't get this done, vote them out, send them home. We got to get this thing done. Thank you. I've got to say, it's an honor to be with these advocates of justice. Thank you for including me. Um, my name is Dwayne Peterson, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some perspectives I've gathered across my careers. I served nine years as a patrol officer with the Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD, and eight years as a special agent with the California Department of Justice. I literally swore an oath to defend the Constitution, and I proudly served my community. And those were rough years of violent crime. Los Angeles suffered a thousand murders in a single year when I was on duty. I understand and deeply respect the challenges of working in public safety. Then I had the sense to choose Vermont and like so many others, moved my family here. 10 years ago, I founded, uh, co-founded Sun Common, which is the state's largest clean energy business. Now a wholly owned subsidiary of another great Vermont company, iSun. While those various experiences brought me some insights I'd like to share, I'm here in my personal capacity and not on behalf of any of those entities. I'm here because I believe the very concept of qualified immunity is simply indefensible. Notice that those who oppose this reform don't celebrate this bizarre legal doctrine, but focus on what they fear would happen when we eliminate it. They allege that it would contribute to police malaise, make it more difficult to recruit new folks into law enforcement, or that it would burden municipalities. I'd like to address each of these. Qualified immunity is indefensible. It doesn't protect law enforcement practitioners from frivolous lawsuits, nor from accountability arising from their official actions. There are well-established pathways in the judicial system to address these, rather, it exists to prohibit victims whose constitutional rights were violated from seeking justice. It only protects those who, by definition, acted unreasonably. Now, notably, those who oppose ending this weird doctrine tend not to defend it, but instead allege harms from enacting this common sense reform. Police officials claim that morale already challenged during these difficult times as law enforcement seeks to regain the public trust, the law enforcement would suffer further by adding this protection for unconstitutional actions and that recruiting would suffer too. I don't believe that a full-throated defense of upholding the United States Constitution would dispirit police officers or dissuade others from joining the ranks. I saw firsthand how good cops detest the bad cops. Standing with the Constitution can only be good. And now as an employer, in what is the toughest labor market in my lifetime, I know that young people are voracious consumers of media and have intense BS filters on what's right and wrong. The pathway to attracting millennials, women, and BIPOC folk into fulfilling careers in public safety is hardly by clinging to vestiges of injustice like qualified immunity. Better to tout the recent policing reforms enacted and an end to qualified immunity as visible commitments to improved policing as recruiting tools for the next generation. We also heard that municipalities would be harmed by the confirmation of constitutional rights. One of the aspects I appreciated about the Los Angeles Police Department was that I knew that organization had my back. I received two department commendations and never a citizen complaint. But I knew that if I were unfairly accused, 
or even if I made a mistake on duty, LAPD would be there for me. So too at my current job, our people are indemnified for their work. I believe Vermont police would expect the same. Adding liability coverage for this niche risk is right to protect folks on the front lines. But I've also learned a lot from the caring Vermont business community, including that liability insurance isn't just about protecting a company's assets, but in creating a pool that's available to do right by victims of accidents or wrongdoing. Insurance appropriately provides for those who suffer harm. Our municipalities seeking to shirk that liability and merely shifting the risk and cost to victims, that's not right. So I believe qualified immunity intended to protect violations of the Constitution is indefensible. And worries about righting this wrong are unpersuasive as reasons to perpetuate injustice. That's my perspective as a former police officer. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, two speakers left to introduce Jerry Greenfield, co-founder of Ben & Jerry's and co-chair of the campaign to end qualified immunity. Jerry. Ben and I are here today both as co-founders of Ben & Jerry's and also as the co-chairs of the campaign to end qualified immunity. We've been engaged in this work for the last two years, both at the federal level and in about a dozen states. And one of the most remarkable things about this effort for justice is the broad ideological base of groups and organizations who are seeking to end qualified immunity. It starts at the Supreme Court with both Clarence Thomas and Sonia Sotomayor agreeing that qualified immunity needs to be ended or significantly reformed. And just last year, Ben and I co-wrote an op-ed with the general counsel of Koch Industries urging an end to qualified immunity in New Mexico. Imagine that. Ben and Jerry writing an op-ed with the general counsel of Coke Industries. Who would have guessed? Not us, but the issue is that important and that compelling. And then look at who we have here today representing all of Vermont. Elected officials, business people, former law enforcement, grassroots organizers, racial justice advocates. It's incredible across the state. And we all agree, yes, police have a difficult job. And we want to celebrate the police when they do a good job. We say, love the good ones. And at the same time, when people's rights are violated, they need to be able to get justice. We need to end qualified immunity now. Thank you. And finally, Ben Cohen, co-founder of Ben & Jerry's, co-chair of the campaign to end qualified immunity. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Hello. First, I want to thank the huge majority of Vermont police officers who are dedicated to helping out, to protecting and serving in all sorts of difficult situations. Men and women who go about their jobs thoughtfully and with concern and care for the people they encounter every day. And here's some things that we as Vermonters and Americans all believe in. No one should be above the law. Everybody is entitled to their day in court. Everybody deserves equal justice under the law. 
and you'd be hard pressed to find a Vermonter who believes that police should be immune from prosecution if accused of breaking the law. Let's face it, the status quo is not working. Trust in our police is at an all time low. And it's trust between the community and police that is foundational to effective public safety. We need to understand that trust and accountability go hand in hand. If you're not willing to be held accountable, people aren't going to trust you. The way to rebuild that trust is not to persist in the same old ways. It's to bring allegations of police abuse into the sunlight, into a court of law, and let a jury decide. That's really all overturning qualified immunity is about. Letting an aggrieved person have their day in court and letting a jury decide. We believe in government of the people, by the people, for the people. Ours is a representative democracy where our elected representatives support the will of the people. 75% of Vermonters believe that police officers should not be immune from prosecution. Police officers disagree. I get that. It's natural. Everybody would like to be immune from prosecution. Nobody wants to be held accountable. If somebody told me, hey, Ben, you're currently immune from prosecution. Is it OK if we take away that immunity? Hell no! <laughs> but when police officers say that they can't do their jobs without immunity from prosecution, what they're actually saying is that they do not believe they can do their jobs without violating people's constitutional or civil rights. And that is not the kind of policing we want in a free society. I get that it's easier to do the job if you don't have to worry about trampling people's rights. But protecting and serving some people while abusing others is not the kind of policing Vermonters want. Overturning qualified immunity is not about saying a policeman is guilty or that he or she did something wrong. All it's about is allowing a person who feels abused to have their day in court and letting a jury decide. That is justice. That is our system of accountability. Saying that police are not to be held accountable is unjust. All we're saying is that police should be held accountable in a court of law just like everybody else. Well, people say this is Vermont. It can't happen here, but it does. And we've had a lot of examples today about how it continues to happen in our state, mostly toward people of color. So people who tend to be abused by a rogue cop don't look like me. They yes, tend they to do. be they look like me. They tend to be people of color or lower income. So it's difficult for people like me to understand the problem because it's not our lived reality. We need to hear the voices of those not like us. You've been telling me to shut up for years when I've been telling you that about this very thing. that are crying out for justice. We need to believe what they're telling us. We need to stand up for those who suffer the day-to-day -day indignities of being other. It's white people. And now they're concerned when black people are doing it. Yeah, like, yeah, you know what? This is a cultural problem. Militarization of police is a problem for white people and black people.
It's white people, the majority that have the power in our society. It's a problem, but you guys don't want to have that, that conversation because black people serve in the military too. And I married a black woman. I'm not a racist, even though you want to call me one. You never listen to my side of the story because you've been telling me to shut up for 10 years. You ruined my lives and you fucking helped the cops and you kicked me when I was down doing the very thing you were saying right now. So I'd like you to think about three numbers. The first is 450,000. The second is 1,700. And the last number is five. 450,000. The people of Vermont have spoken. Over 75% of us, that's 450,000 Vermont citizens, want to hold police officers accountable by overturning an antiquated doctrine. 1,700. There's 1,700 police in our state who do not want to be held accountable. We get that. But being held accountable is a requirement of any job. And it should be especially a requirement for people we authorize to use physical and lethal force in our name. Five, but somehow or other, our system of representative government is failing us. And a committee of five people in the Vermont legislature appears to be about to eviscerate Senate Bill 254. This will deny the full legislature the ability to vote to end qualified immunity, and it'll continue to keep bad cops immune from prosecution. That is not a representative democracy. That is a police state in which cops are above the law. There's a clear desire of Vermonters who care about the rights of their fellow citizens. So we ask, pass a bill to overturn qualified immunity out of committee so that the full legislature has a chance to vote on it. Five people should not use their power to overrule the will of 450,000 Vermonters. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. I assume uh, folks participating in the press conference will be happy to take any questions if you have them. And then we will open the shop for folks who want ice cream. We'll have about 10 minutes to get people in and out. So What's this thank about, you. Sir? And qualified immunity. So, any questions? I, I have a question probably for our uh, elected leaders. Uh, we, we keep talking about these changes that were made in the oh, judiciary you? on, I believe, Friday before the town meeting day break. Certainly the bill has been watered down quite a bit. I mean, is the form that it's in right now, is, is that something that, that you guys would support? Or is that kind of a non-starter on your end? Legislators. Oh, yeah. yeah. So my understanding, uh, is that, oh, sorry, yeah. my understanding in talking with uh, members of the coalition that what was being discussed last week in committee um, is not a uh, compromise that they could get behind. So the committee is going to continue to do their work. The conversation is not done. And so we're, we're continuing to engage the committee with a path forward. So. But I think I got a strong message this morning as it stands now. The compromise that was considered last week is not something that we can get behind. The only thing I would add is that I have another piece of legislation, S-250, that has the end to qualified immunity intact. 
It also has independent investigation into use of force, making sure that if there is misconduct from an officer, it's put into a registry and follows them so they can't escape uh, accountability for actions of misclassifying information or misconduct, as well as banning the use of false information uh, to coerce a confession. So we have a comprehensive bill in Senate government operations, and my hope is that the pro tem will join me in helping to advance that bill out of Senate government operations that has ending qualified immunity if we can't remain uh, strong on ending qualified immunity as it stands in Senate judiciary. Can I speak? People, can I speak? I'm a victim of the hate crime bill that was passed by Madeleine Cunin, and I am Roger Maycumber. The eyes of God held me up. If I had bashed against the brick wall, then they exposed the front level of my brain and kicked the left eye out of my head. I am a victim. Tom Trombley found me, and if he hadn't, I would be dead. I am the reckoning of Christ, and I kid you not, I want you people to know that. And I'm writing a book called Help Out Me by Robert William Wright. And you're gonna make me a millionaire and I'm gonna take care of everybody. I'm supposed to do this today. I came back. God bless you all. I walk in the eyes of Christ and Jesus Christ and the mother of Mary. Thank you all for what you do for everybody. And everybody is equal and in the eyes of God. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and thank you all for what we do for each other. Did you want to have some ice cream after the uh, I'm coming back. I'm going to buy eight candles. I bought yeah. the Tree of Life at my family's furniture store, Tina Fabrics. Okay. Thank you.